Parsons got me on the moon. Jack Parsons got me on the moon. Good evening everybody and welcome to The Velocity of Now with me, your host Thomas Sheridan. It is the end of May, coming towards the end of May. It'll be a Sunday night when this goes out, 2024. I hope you're all keeping well during these turbulent but extremely interesting times as the world goes through a kind of a wave function collapse and reality becomes less real and imagination becomes the engine of salvation but not in the christian sense so we have a good few things to talk about tonight it'll be esoteric focused more or less and the first thing i want to talk about is last saturday i was in the countryside and i was having a walk and i stopped next to a wall this is in north county sligo and I leaned up against the wall, the weather was lovely, and I went to check my message. I got a a text message on my phone, and I went to check the text message. And you know the way, before you put the screen on, you can see your reflection and what's behind you in the black mirror screen. The black, you know, the scrying mirror, as I call it, but this time it really was. And behind me was... A face, a figure of a man who was probably between 10 and 12 feet tall, wearing like a black cape with no, with the hood down. So, but you could see no features, it was pure black. And I was instantly like turned around to see what that was. And it wasn't there, it, it only appeared in the glass, the black glass of the screen. And it wasn't there when I turned around and looked again. And it was between two large sycamore trees, which had a clear view to the horizon, practically. So there was nothing in between those two large sycamore trees and where this figure was standing. And I mentioned it on Facebook last Saturday, and I put up an illustration that I quickly drawn in my, my jotter, in my book, and 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 they said, "What is it?" And people said, "You know, Fomorians." No, sorry, they didn't say Fomorians at first. He said, "Like Shadow Paris and blah blah blah." And it it you know this is a kind of haunted part of Ireland. You know, it's you know between all the megaliths and you know I'm not far from Drumcliffe Church where William Butler Yeats is, and there's lots of interesting sites all around here, and it is a very kind of magical ancient place. And then a friend of mine I was having coffee with later on said it was a Fomorian. And I and I just, yes, it is a Fomorian. My, it, that's what it was. It was a Fomorian. And the Fomorians were a race of giants that were defeated at the Second Battle of Moitura 
down at the Neal in count on the county Mayo County Galway borders. There was two battles actually, and there's a very interesting theory that one concerned a battle of the subconscious mind, and the other was an actual physical battle. So very much like the Battle of Purawashka in the the Bhagavad Gita, not only do you have the battlefield itself, but you also have the battle field of consciousness uh, dialogue going be- on between uh, uh, between Krishna and Ar- Prince Arjuna. Uh, you know, what is the meaning of life and this kind of thing. So there's very good theories out there that the battle of my my thur- my Torah was actually very similar. One was a physical battle. The final real battle took place near Loch Allen in in West County Sligo, and that's where Nuada of the Silver Arm was killed by Balor of the Evil Eye. He fell down, and his eye burned a hole in the ground where Loch Nasul is. Loch Nasul means the the, the lay of the the light the lake of the eye, and his like radioactive eye burned a hole in the ground, and the lake is still there today. And it has this remarkable thing where it drains every few years well every 20 or 30 years sometimes more 50 years and people used to come from all over Ireland when it drained to see it where Balor had fallen down but a friend of mine Kieran Cullen who lives below the mountains there is a poet and he's he was he was a he's a keen fisherman and hunter and he got me he got me uh some rocks from the bottom of Loch Nassau and they were definitely burnt by some kind of high powered energy so to make of that what you will whether it's an allegory for a meteor or something but that that's a, that's where the second battle of Moitura happened and Lu of the long arm Lulan Fada the, the Indo-European god and there's also the, the sort of like the supreme godhead of the, the Irish pagan pantheon male one er, Eru is the supreme godhead goddess mother goddess but the supreme male one is Lulan Fada and Lu slew Balor after he'd killed Nuada and there's a big megalith up there it's one of the largest dolmen capstones in Europe uh, uh, it's, it's, it's called the Labby Rock and it's called the Labby Rock because it was called the Laba Rock or Carrick Laba which was supposed to be the place where the sort of mythical great lovers of Ireland of Irish mythology Dermot Dier- Dier- and Gronya they made love on their their first night on top of that megalith but it's also where below it is the the, the legend goes that's where Nuada of the Silver Arm is buried so it's a fantastic history but the the two of the Dallin were sort of like a semi-mystical race then ruled Ireland until the arrival of the Milesian Gales now they, they'd banished the Fomorians their, their eternal enemy these giants from across these giants from across the sea and they had lived in Ireland and then the arrival of the Milesian Gaels who came from northern Spain Portugal and they were the Gaelic people that's the people of Ireland today who arrived in the Bronze Age about 3,000 4,000 years ago and they became the Irish the Gaelics the Gaelic people but they defeated the the two of the Danon, mainly by magic as well as battle, the 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 Druid American of the of the Milesian Gaels of the Gaelic people, these would have been Iberians. Now this is why the Irish, so many Irish have jet black hair and blue eyes, and uh, which is very unusual in Europe, in Northern Europe, to have jet black hair, and. They've defeated them with magic as much as anything. There's this famous thing of uh, American's invocation where he uses a satire and a poem to destroy the two of the Danon. And the two of the Danon, then the legend is they retreat into the hills and barrows and mounds and tumuli and megaliths and rats of Ireland. And they wait there until the day when Ireland is in its greatest peril and then they will return from these places and arise again to help save Ireland now they didn't show up during the famine and they didn't show up during the 700 years of Anglo-English and then British rule 
and then all the sectarian wars but they seem to be showing up now which tells you something very powerful indeed as Ireland is being destroyed on purpose by the globalists now my theory is that we have codes that the two of the Danon are not literally although they were associated with the, the she, the fairies and stuff that when you go to these places, a fairy ring just down there and they're associated with those kinds of places and the fairies and they, they don't leave those areas but they're in the, the, in the, in the other world, the Irish other world and when the two of the Danon returns my theory was that there will be a DNA activation of ancient codes and those of us who are in the Tua are the ones who could see what's being done to Ireland right now and are, we're back we've returned not physically as them well we are but it's, the genetic codes have been switched on and I think it's happening in other countries too in other tribes I really do I think it's happening and I wonder if the needlecraft was an attempt to stop all that I really really do but anyway, who's the adversary for those of us who are who had our who are the Tua? And it's funny because I never really thought about it until recently. But all during the lockdown, I was referring to us as the tribe, and Tua means tribe in in, in Irish. So the Tua de Danann is the tribe of the goddess Danu, who is a very powerful Indo-European goddess. The the river Danube is named after her. It's a phenomenal history when you start getting into it, even though it's pseudographical and, you know, pseudo historical. And it, but it's like the Grail mysteries in France and England. You know that there's some profound truth to them at the end of the day. And this is this is what's happening. So okay, I saw this figure. Was it a hallucination? No, it wasn't a hallucination because I, I wasn't drunk or on drugs or anything. And I don't, I've never had hallucinations outside. One time I fell and hurt myself. I banged my head when I was a teenager. And uh, no, I was younger, I was like 12. I was on the back of a motorcycle and fell off. And I got a bit dizzy and I, I saw these like weird shapes and stuff. But that was the that was an injury. But uh, I was fine after that. There was no, no, luckily there was no damage. But I've never had hallucinations outside of things like drugs, LSD, and you know, mushrooms and stuff like that. And, uh, and so other kinds of drugs but I've had real visions and real visions are not hallucinations like when I saw Sobek and so uh, it, it, this is where we are now and so the for more, it's not surprising I didn't think about like I don't think of a lot of things I just say them impulsively like I was going on about tribe and I never thought that's the Tua and I was going on about this black creature this black giant behind me who must have been about three meters tall? That's what's that like a nine to eleven feet, and uh, it wasn't someone. To my friend told me it was. Oh, it's a Fomorian, and there, there you go. So it's you know this is why myth Joseph Campbell mythology is more important than lots of things because mythology is the true story. It's a true story. That's the mythology is the truth not the it's not the allegory it's not the the metaphor it is the fundamental truth of existence and this is why they've always tried to replace it with religion you know one of the, I was watching a very disturbing video of young muslims in Sin, sydney walking through a shopping center and they were, they were ready for jihad that, that you know it's one of those like things you see like war is coming and it reminded me so much of the final scene of Children of Men, where you have the the like ISIS type crowd going Alu Akbar walking through London. It reminded me so much of that. And um, you look at religious fanaticism, not just in that religion, but in all religions, uh, it's an inhibitor to spiritual growth. This is a this is you know we're given one of the reasons mythology is true is we're given barriers or inhibitors towards our growth both as a species, as a civilization, as people and as souls. And I really do believe that religion is a barrier to spiritual growth on the whole. You know, we won't spiritually evolve as a, as a species until we've removed or 
transcended religion because religion is a buffer to spiritual growth. These are challenges. These are, you know, the minotaur and the, this is the, the whole thing. There's, along the way, there are, there are buffers, inhibitors, barriers, and one of them is religion. And uh, the Semitic people, and as well as the Persian people, uh, they're dealing with an enormous barrier with Islam. Just like in the 1950s, the Irish dealt with that in Catholicism. And the other part of the country it was free Presbyterianism. These are inhibitors to spiritual growth. And we now have paganism growing in Ireland now, but we now have cat, what the Burkean called cat lady paganism, which is like, you know, woke and lefty and totally distorts the meaning of the Irish parables and mythology and into saying it's, you know, it, it's a what they're not. And we have the same time we have genuine a genuine growth in Indo-European paganism, which is what I'm kind of like about. Now, I know people have a problem with the term pagan. They see it as a slur. Uh, I, I'm just, you know, it's just a handy frame. I'm not bothered by it as the term. It just means, it just basically meant country bumpkin. And there's a lot more, what worse things you can be called than a country bumpkin, you know. And so it doesn't bother me that much. And um, the, you know, what we, you know, what do you call us otherwise? You know, I, I guess a, a, a Indo-European, native Irish Indo-European pagan. If you live in England, you're a NATO Anglo-Saxon slash Celtic European pagan you know European Indo-European traditional religion you know non-Abrahamic so you know as difficult as some people have with the term paganism it's really all we have to work with for now uh, I can't you know this, everyone can suggest a name for what we are uh, but unfortunately they're not going to stick like this and I see paganism as sort of like, yeah, well, I mean, they started calling us this when they started to destroy us. And so, you know, it's not that we're being defined by our victimhood. We're being defined by our tenacity that after 2,000 years we're still here. So, um, well, we're st- you know, people, th- this is one of the problems with Christianity is it gives a belief in salvation is somehow imminent. We had the recent eclipse in America and people were losing their nuts claiming that they were all going to be raptured up or Jesus is coming and they will come. With paganism, you don't have that really. You have cycles. It's cyclical. And there's a notion that... The notion is that you will... It's a constant epic, you know... Wouldn't you rather live and live and die in an epic and be reborn again and to live and die in an epic, than to, you know, restrict your behaviour and restrict your growth as a person in order for a payoff at the end of the day of being in poverty, being impoverished, uh, having all kinds of psychiatric issues because you have to love your neighbour. You know this kind of thing, even though they're horrible people, than just being free and open, saying I don't have to like this person, and uh, the reason why my na- my next door neighbour's an asshole is he's a he's a monster. I have to overcome. I have to deal with it somehow. Uh, that's getting a better job and moving away, whatever you know. But I will or learning to learning the patience to ignore them. But that's that's a stro- that's that's you don't pray you don't do a decade of the rosary, or pray to baby Jesus for that. What you do is you you learn to overcome the tr- the the, tr- the struggle, and a struggle towards triumph. And it's not punishment. It's not this oh that the Lord gives us battles. It's not like that. These are battles that if you lose them, you have a chance in another domain in your life, another element of your life, and that's what's beautiful about it. And that's what's that's what's honourable about it. So I don't have any problem with it. So the Fomorians, you know, I, I guess it w- wasn't, I wouldn't say it's naive of me, it was just more like absent-minded of me to say that, like, here I am calling myself and, well, feeling myself, and it's not narcissistic, it's a genuine feeling, and I know many out there are feeling it too, that the, the two of the Danon codes have been unlocked and we're back. But it would be, it was absent-minded of me to assume 
that the Fomorians wouldn't be waiting there to ambush me. Thinking again about the moon in light, I don't know why, it shouldn't really, it's not really connected, but I guess like to the whole kind of cosmism thing. I genuinely believe that, you know, as a kind of a, a chaos god kind of things, space travel has tr tremendous potential in terms of uh, unleashing a charge in terms of magic, magical practice. I'm thinking of things like the Voyager spacecraft. Very interesting. Uh, a few months ago, it started sending back gobbledygook back to the c control to the command center. And at the time, I theorized that well, perhaps it's outside of the the solar system now, and it's in interstellar space. And maybe in interstellar space, the rules of literal reality break down and collapse in a kind of a intergalactic wave function collapse. This is why I don't believe human intergalactic travel, I don't even believe human interplanetary travel is, is possible. I'll talk about that in a minute. The rules of space-time had fallen apart. The further it gets away from the sun and hence all the gobbledygook it was transmitting. Now, according to the, the command center, uh, they've actually fixed it, the computer problem and the software problem, and it's now transmitting back, you know, pl the, the correct data, which I find interesting anyway. It's got a kind of a Higgs boson kind of vibe about it. But in effect, the Voyager spacecraft, it died and it was resurrected. Uh, you know, the revealer of cosmic worlds, the revealer of planets. That thing, when that thing left Earth and where it is now, especially, and where it's going, no human will ever lay eyes on it ever again. So it has become unattainable in terms of it being, a, a, you know, a material object. So it's therefore, it exists, it works, but it's so, it's beyond the reach of human you know tangibility it's only connect it's only accessible through radio signals that are sent back via its you know how it keep its power going it has a mini nuclear reactor on board that's how it's it's not batteries it, it did have batteries for the early days that were used to to uh, help change its tra trajectory and things like that you know planetary uh, slingshots uh, but it doesn't have a battery. The batteries died years ago. It's now using the the small. Well, it always was used. There was the batteries are being charged by this this small nuclear power plant that keeps the power going. And it it's out there in interstellar space. It'll never be seen by a human being physically, but our eyes ever again. It will never be touched. It will never be examined. And it just goes off into the cosmos, doing its thing. So it has this kind of uh, cosmic chaos god aspect to it. This is something that has greatly interested me since the mid-90s when I got involved in the Discordia scene in New York. Uh, the uh, the idea that, that an intangible machine can attain godhood. Now we all know that from the, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the computer that will replace the next computer to give the answer 42. Yes, but that's that. even though that's a satirical take on it, there's a lot of truth to it. That This, to me, is more plausible than transhumanism because it doesn't affect humans. It's humans... You just think now that, like, Voyager is now Stonehenge in space. It has the same Stonehenge and megalithic sites like it were probably built almost certainly in the case of Stonehenge there's tremendous evidence that it has uh, cosmic alignments and so with some of the Irish ones too particularly Loch Crew Cairn L in, in Loch Crew here in Ireland and lots and several others you can say absolutely these have solar and lunar alignments so it, they were spaceships of a kind and they brought the cosmos down into the world of man through quantification and measurement by means of ritual you think now that's that you know what began with say the first time humans built monuments for to align with the sun and the moon well voyager is the current expression of that 
it's now out there doing the same thing but it's now unattainable in the same way that the people have been Stonehenge they're unattainable to us we, we only can assume it was built as a, as a calendar or as a, as a kind of a cosmic astronomy as maybe primitive astrology type thing ritual thing quantif- but we, can only, we, can, we don't know because they're gone and the same thing with Voyager it's out there in the cosmos and it's gone so it becomes sanctified uh, by its its time and distance and it's it's now utter and total inability to to ever touch see or work on it ever again so that got me you know i've always been interested in the concept of space being a kind of a pseudo mystical experience I very much have a lot of sympathy for co- the cosmism of the Soviet Union and the belief that, you know, that the what the spiritual forces are accessible in space but not on Earth. And that, funny enough, that ties in a lot with theosophy. Uh, theosophists believe that, you know, God is the God of the universe, but the God of this Earth is, is the esoteric Lucifer, who is the God of this Earth. Now, and so that's just that's just the deal how it works and that's how they interpret the scriptures of the fall and there's lots of other myth- mythological and, and you know religious scriptures they use to kind of but beef that up but it's an interesting idea so where does that leave the moon you know so outer space beyond the lunar orbit is the domain of the gods right you know and and, and that's that's almost literally taken through Astronomy, the name of bodies, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Venus, so on. But where does that take us with the moon? The moon is a funny one, you know. It's a kind of like, it's kind of like the boatman across the the river Styx, Sharon. It's got that kind of element about it. And the moon has a haunted energy about it. There's something very strange about the moon. It, the fact that it, you know, perfectly blanks out the sun and is, you know, at the eclipse and vice versa is fascinating. At just the right distance and the right diameter, it does it. I mean, that can't be by accident. It just can't. And there's a, there are theories out there that who built the moon. There's a book called Who Built the Moon? And that it's actually a giant spaceship that was put into orbit. Uh, you have like the very negative side like the David Icke saying it's the reptilians doing it and there was a recent hocus focus uh, Sarah covered the, the, the mysteries of the moon and, and she made that point it's not this reptilian machine to punish us how could it be when it regulates things like the seasons and stuff the, life on this planet would be very difficult if near impossible without the moon and so part of me my theory not my theory but an idea that came to me many years ago through a kind of a mystical experience was that consciousness in its primal form at the bottom of the deepest ocean in, in order to evolve to the surface and become what was basically humans it had to regulate life on the surface and stabilize it and it did this by capturing an asteroid or a planetoid and putting it into orbit at just the right speed shape and distance and that was the moon but the moon itself is is a kind of a a kind of an, a spiritual danger land. I think uh, that's why I don't. That's why so many of the astronauts who went to the Apollo missions have never been the same people that they came back. And this is why there's been a great. It's had this effect upon people. I, when I was making, I've said this many times. A Libra velocity. I looked at every single photograph of the moon from the JPL website and I I had to stop at one point uh, because I was looking into a haunted ghostly realm the the moon is a domain of ghosts and there's been lots of uh, theories uh, that there were things seen on the moon or there was experiences on the moon that they don't want to talk about that they even knew about before they sent the Apollo missions that they had been found out from earlier probes and the Russians especially had found out about it, that the moon is some kind of strange. This is like this kind of like validated their cosmism, 
is some kind of strange reality. And I agree with that. There's something about the moon. There's something there. There's some. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a realm, a domain of ghosts, something like that. And don't ask me to explain why. I can't. Uh, but this, it's almost like the gate of the gods. You know that the moon. You know, it's just like the beginning of the call of Cthulhu. We are. We were not meant to travel far. And you know the moon was almost like a psychic inhibitor, barrier, buffer to moving beyond this. You know, moving uh, beyond this, and this is shown up in many things, and in particular movies. I saw Ad Astra that film a few years ago with Brad Pitt. And there's a part where the moon has basically become Sin City and a very dangerous place for for bandits and so on. And there's like gang shootouts on the moon. And it's actually, it seems, it sounds, it sounds absurd at first. But when you watch the movie, you realize that like, did, did have, if man set up bases on the moon, they would quickly become degenerate because we were moved, we were removed from the earth and it's the same in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 the the moon becomes the portal to Jupiter because they find the obelisk on the moon remember that even though we had the monkey folk on earth at the beginning around the obelisk that was not the one found in the movies the one found in the movie was on the moon that's where they found it and so this is brings us to the wider subject of movies not just sci-fi but horror movies especially have deeper meanings in them that this is why we you know we make a big deal of this on myself Sarah and I on Hocus Focus and I on my own Beyond Room 313 channel with the reviewers these movies horror movies and these kinds of cosmic sci-fi movies along with the books and comics and everything they they grow your mind in a different direction and there was a book that came out called The Horror Film, written by a guy called Ivan Butler. It was back in the late 60s. And, and the, there was a few books came out back then. And one of them that I actually I referenced, well, I didn't reference, but it gave me a, a lot of insight, although I didn't cite anything from it, was a book from Caligari to Hitler by a guy called Seyfried Kautschauer. And that was re released in the ni late 1970s. The whole thing of... The horror film, the cosmic horror film, and its connection to the subconscious mind to affect us in ways that are far more insightful than we realize. Now, Ivan Butler, in his book, The Horror Film, he said, to convey a genuinely supernatural atmosphere in a film is far more difficult than one might think. Seeing is not the same thing as believing. Those which have succeeded best have drawn on certain mythical themes which evoke a universal response among filmgoers, the archetype. Now, theoretically, the best form of suit to cinema that is suited to the presence of the supernatural is the horror or the cosmic horror film you always hear me talking about things like hammer films and equator mass films and how the huge set the huge effect they had on me as a child and still continue to as of his child now butler butler compared the watching of a horror film to be very similar to a seance that there's the same semi-darkness the same atmosphere of sympathetic concentration and anticipation and then the the er, the arisal of the opportunity for the the viewers judgment to be swayed by collective emotions so that the the image on the screen although it's not tangible it becomes real by means of imagination and that's magic you know it's real real magic now, to the to most people, to the average person, 
very rarely do they gain any kind of sensation, a meaningful sensation, of the supernatural from what happens watching a horror film. We're talking about NPCs and normies. The, the rest of us, it's different because we, we're seeing symbols and we're seeing mythologies and we're seeing archetypes. Those of us, the, the tribe-like people, the kind of people that listen to VON. And in the case of the supernatural and the best films, seeing is really not believing. It just isn't. Now, the paradox here is the more markedly bizarre and mysterious the methods of the filmmaker uses to create a supernatural event, the less easily disposed that a film goes to fall underneath his spell. Now, that's very interesting. So, the the normies have to have literal blatant slashers and stuff like that where those of us who are like the kind of Vaughn listener can look at that film and you know peel the onion layers to get to the archetypes the, the, the layers of onions are different archetypes to get to the symbolism of the whole thing and we enjoy films on a completely different level than the normies of the NPC do, do because we have a symbolic literacy and an archetypal awareness that allows us to do this and this is why horror films are so they're so like Greg, Greg Moffat at Mysterious Earth last year gave a presentation on it from Greg Moffat from Legalized Freedom and he has that on his website on his YouTube channel and yeah I mean that everyone that was in that audience watched that presentation and said like that's that's me that's how these things made me feel and he spoke about TV shows that had that kind of like haunted cinema, folk horror, mythology slash, you know, cultural dynamic of a certain period that was tremendous impact upon our formative con consciousness of a certain generation, of a few generations. It's not so much now because horror films tend to be very literal. Well, not always, but they do tend to be. Now, at the beginning of filmmaking, right at the very beginning, the French director George Miles in 1890 made short fantasy films using stop-action photography. And people would vanish like they would, and appear like they were ghosts. You've all seen them. And he would use double exposures, like running the film tr through the through the projector, and then running it again with a, a person dressed as a ghost. And this would create like actors who are transparent phantoms. He was M Melias was an actual genius, to me. and audiences were they saw it as a novelty. They saw it as a, a bit of fun, and they were fascinated by the technical, the technical elements that made it happen. And it launched, you know, the careers of many filmmakers. But they were, you know, Melias' films were really just novelty. It was like the the ghost train in the fairground, more than actual. Uh, deep, deep, anything deep. So, at the same time, there were two other Frenchmen, the Luminaire, Luminaire brothers, who were filming reality with very like documentary-like precision. And they, we've all seen their films. They had traveled all over the world filming workers coming out of factories, getting off trains, and so on. And they've been, they're very primitive forms of uh, what's the word uh, when. When, when you study, you know, ancient tribes and so on, this kind of thing. And the, the, the people would walk towards the screen of the luminary films, anthropolo anthropology, and would vanish off the sides. And these films actually frightened a lot of people. They had only, the first films they'd ever seen were kind of like fantasy. And then suddenly they were seeing documentary, very well filmed documentary with better quality cameras of people like them walking towards the camera and then vanishing off the side. That really messed them up. And even there was even panics in Sun Cinema. It, people couldn't, it was a whole new experience. They could barely deal with it. Sitting there in the dark and seeing this. I went to an art exhibition at the Model Art Centre in Sligo about 15 years ago. And they had they do have some good exhibitions there uh, and this was a kind of a it was one to do with dreams and nightmares and it was a black room in the in the place and at the end of the room were people who were in semi-darkness 
on a gigantic screen projected on the wall looking at you as if you had materialized in their reality it was very very powerful very powerful so when the actual technology of cinema became more sophisticated the supernatural films became adept to these effects that the luminary the luminary brothers had you know accidentally stumbled upon with the documentaries they reflect the world we know and we recognize but they throw us psychologically off kilter they get us you know think of analogy they get us to the dark at the top of the stairs we first have to go up that staircase make the journey into the unknown and it's even more frightening so we have to keep a firm grip on the banister or in this case the the handle on the chair in the cinema now uh, the filmmakers is a term called jam and which the the otherness of things are, are brought to the forward by using techniques that are not normally uh, you know aware to the to the average normie audience so for instance infrared film was used to shoot the night scenes of the haunted house in Robert Weiss's film The Haunting in 1963 so the tonal values of the mansion appear like daylight but as daylight transfigured on the screen by suggestions of a presence not altogether normal a more recent version of that was 28 days later that very powerful and quite you know a insightful scene of Killian Murphy on Westminster Bridge that scene apparently was sh it has this almost like strange lo-fi dreamlike quality where he's standing in deserted London in his hospital gown carrying a shopping bag and there's just litter in him apparently that was filmed late on a Sunday night in full darkness but they lit the scene up with massive lights so that's why it has that weird kind of dreamlike effect and that even people that didn't really care for the movies 28 days later and I, I would say I, I like that film but I wouldn't say I was like mad about it but that that scene with Killian Murphy on Westminster Bridge always stands out in people's minds so that goes back to The Haunting with Robert Wise's film where he incorporated those kinds of like otherness using film and lightning technology also time is an important thing in these films as well how the camera you know lingers on the scenes on a chair in a corridor or moving down a corridor or even a folk following a street light creating this supernatural dreamlike effect you see that in a lot of my documentaries too like i will use those kinds of you know sort of visionary scenes that they're not necessarily appropriate to what i'm talking about but they're just strange enough to make the words that I'm saying appear more intense. So, you know, they become they become apparitions that are frightening, but send, seldom seen. In a, in a, in a horror scene in a sense, because we what we do is in these kinds of films, we project our apprehension far more powerfully onto the empty onto the unseen onto the the mysterious than we do to the visible to the obvious so for boarding sets in and we create a kind of a specter of our own anticipation now you can use even more sophisticated techniques along with our understanding the growth and the understanding of psychology that took place during the same time that the cinema was young. young and Freud were coming along at the same time cinema was coming along and astute film directors were you know they were on board with this notion of as were many writers of using the subconscious world but there was an element of osmosis to it as well and many of them may not have read Jung or Freud uh, you met, uh, in fact many probably didn't it's just like it was it was just what was going on in the 20th century it, you know john michael greer's book on pluto and the discovery of pluto opened up uh, this change in humanity that led to things like modern art and psychoanalysis but it also led to things like lovecraft so lovecraft many of many of the lovecraft stories like the rats in the wall are absolutely jungian and focused but there's no evidence anywhere in any of his letters that he ever read the theories 
of Carl Jung's collective unconscious, which is just so they, these things happen by osmosis. Remember that they're never they don't necessarily have to have someone that births them. They can all be born at the same time. The same way that megaliths, all the interest in megaliths, all connected to astronomy, all happened at the same time during the nineteen sixties. Not just Stonehenge, but like it, it, books just appeared everywhere at the same time. Now, with these 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 sophisticated, you know, technical developments, I'm talking about to exploit people's fears. The actual cinema ex- still lacks the resources to ineffectively trigger the supernatural experience less so than literature. Literature still has it, more or less. This is why you have the endurance of Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe and Stephen King's uh, literature. You, It's more powerful than what can be pushed out by a projector because of the the, the written word is, requires absolute focus, where in a cinema, if you're on a date with a good-looking girl, you're kind of distracted by her. And you know, and Ed, Edgar Allan Poe and, and writers like you know M. R. James, they would be classic examples along with Lovecraft who are able to communicate these tangible feelings of the supernatural, which in you know still don't aren't capable in cinema. I mean, there still isn't an authentic Lovecraft movie that's been made according to the book there just isn't one yet there's all kinds of adaptations even the color of space is an adaptation a good one at that and the call of cthulhu the one that was made with the stop motion techniques about 10 years ago that's as good as that is it's still in its own way a kind of interpretation why because it's 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 almost impossible to take the resonance that appears on the written word or even on the audiobook of those stories and put them on the big screen. And it's nothing to do with like special effects or anything like that. It's literally that sensation is almost impossible to convey. And that happens a lot. Like you look at a lot of Stephen King's books, the film adaptations have been rubbish. Like the the adaptate the, the stand book is a very much more interesting book than the stand TV movie, which is awful. Just awful. There's a there's there's a much more chaotic feel in the book. The characters have a depth to them. The the stand movie just comes across as like a kind of a weird Woodstock thing. Edgar Allan Poe's stories, you know, they're 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 mostly fan- fantasies based on suffocation, and very much about isolation, and from the nightmare fears that some great weight which will crush or, you know, impedes the victim. You look at the telltale heart, the victim is beneath the floorboards and he is behind the plaster in the cask of Amatilado and he's literally walled up in the black cat and born alive in Bernice. The, the story, A Descent into the Maelstrom, deals with the air being exhausted as a man drowns but a film is not ideal in conveying this. It really just isn't. Claustrophobia tends to be more of a psychic thing than an actual real thing. It Claustrophobia doesn't work in the same way that, say, vertigo works. You know these videos on the internet, these people climbing, hanging off construction cranes that are on the top of skyscrapers or this kind of thing or... TV transmitter towers are climbing up giant smokestacks. On video, the f- you literally can feel your balls tickling uh, and your your sphincter contracting when you're watching this. Not the ladies, well, I hope not. And uh, but when you see videos of people in tight caves, you don't feel that same sense of claustrophobia. And I'm quite claustrophobic. Although I've been down fairly tight tight caves. Uh, I would have been down the cave of you know the cats, you know the 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 the, the entrance to the underworld. I've been down there in County Roscommon, and I didn't get the, the the claustrophobia there. But 
the only film I think that could really convey that was the Borderlands, the end of the Borderlands. But even then, it was more the horror of them being digested. Sorry, spoiler alerts. Digested by the Lovecraftian entity under the church rather than them actually being in a tight space. The, the other writer spoke about M.R. James. His stories are equally hard to film. Uh, they depend on conveying the sensation of human flesh coming into contact with something solid yet supernatural like a wallpaper pattern that transforms into human hair and this kind of thing um, a whistle and I'll come and get you my lad was made into a, by Jonathan Miller into an interesting television film out of the story but it substitutes the sound of the animate bed sheet for the sight of it the feel of it was of course just not there you, you don't get that and there was a tingler, remember that? In which they tried to frighten the audience by putting electrical uh, vibrations under people's seats in the 90, late, 1950, late 1950s America. And it was fun, uh, but it was more, it was expensive and, you know, they were looking at lawsuits if something went wrong. But it, artistically, people just laughed. So when you're watching a tingler movie and you felt your, your, your seat tingling, people didn't go, oh my God, oh, they burst out laughing. See, it's, it's not the same. The, the best kind of films in portraying the supernatural are when they're based on myths, psychological, uh, religious and sexual. Uh, the deep rooted aspects of the human subconscious and unconscious is, you know, is the, that's when it's be done best. Regardless of if it's a violent slasher movie or a, a sci-fi cosmic film, you know, look, the, the Shining, really, there's nothing in The Shining, really. You know, just a collection of scenes. Uh, but the, the... The lack of control that the, the, fa the humans in that scene have in the front of supernatural forces is much, much better than showing, like, a kind of a demon or a monster. And you have, that's the common theme of the man, the monster becoming the human, the devil in the flesh, this kind of thing, the vampire. And, you know, the golem is kind of an element of that from Jewish uh, folklore, mysticism. And that's, in early Hollywood films, people forget that right up until the 60s, the majority of the people who worked in those movies were actually European immigrants, mostly from Central Europe, and they tended to turn on the archetypes and supernatural myths and folklore of their homelands for inspiration with the traditions of magic and supernatural that wasn't indigenous to what we would call white American culture, although that was a different thing altogether by the time Lovecraft came along, but the, that what did not translate into cinema that had not translated into cinema it, except by the Europeans that had moved to Hollywood from Germany and Bohemia and places like that they came from civilizations that were you know they were more concerned with you know worldly things like you know la land conquest frontier life and the folk heroes of the flesh and blood that would be the Americans while in Europe Euro Central European they had the archetypes of phantoms and the imagination were very very different and that's they were this is what these are the ones who made the horror films and acted in them you know Bela Lugosi and so on in Hollywood the man-made monster you know that 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 really owes itself to the Jewish communities in Central Europe in 1913 there was the Faust story the student of Prague which was made by the a Danish director Stellan Roy and it's told of a student who signs away his mirrored reflection in return for love, riches and honours and eventually kills himself when he kills his own double. By killing the evil in himself, this man destroys an essential part of himself. So goes the, the theory. And it's a very much in the Jekyll and Hyde theme. Now, the star of the film and a remarkable individual called Paul Wegner, who 
when he was working in Bohemia, he I, I've written about this in uh, Valpurgis Night. He heard of the legend of the golem, the body without a soul, and and surrounding that of the 16th century rabbi Rabbi Low, a made out of clay, the, the golem Joseph, to defend the Hebrew uh, community against a pogrom. Now the story inspired Wagner to star uh, in a, a film he made with Heinrich Galen called The Golem which they made in 1914 in which the monsters brought to light to life and given you know grunt like work to do and he falls in love with its creator's daughter and then runs amok and is finally killed when it falls from a high tower very different than the actual legend the film looks fantastic and you know Wegner was a, a, an incredible actor and the plot that he applied to the golem and how it came to be I think is the full name of the, t- the title of the film or how it came into this world he basically took the plot of Frankenstein Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as it was portrayed in you know which it was done even better by Boris Karloff in 1931 but nevertheless there are still a few differences if in the golem a little chi- child removes the star of David from its chest and it becomes a lifeless statue but in Frankenstein it is a, you know, a kind of an atheistic monster that destroys the little child by drowning her the man made monster of American film is not presented as a supernatural weapon of, ju- of jury or religiosity or spiritual forces uh, and it was the original legend, but as an incarnation of man's irreligious challenge to the Christ God, the Promethean, or the whole Promethean thing. In fact, wasn't that the the subtitle of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Promethean, Prometheus Unbound, or something like that? Now, the film The Golem and How It Came Into the World was produced by a South German immigrant called Carl Lamel. No, sorry, the, the Frankenstein film was. And... It, it, it was the head of Universal Studios where many of the Jews who had fled the Third Reich had ended up now significantly the Frankenstein film has more in common with the Golem legend than it does with Mary Shevel's novel on which it is you know, more or less based but it has the original kind of Central European Kabbalistic flavour to it and that's what I think is really makes that film so good it, it's an American Hollywood film but it feels European. It feels like a film that was made by the uh, the Ufta Studios in Berlin. It feel that was it was filmed on location in Prague or Budapest. It feels like that, even though it's very much a Hollywood film. And the the Hollywood Frankenstein introduced the element of escapable logic, the idea that every eerie event should have a rational basis into the Hollywood portrayal of the supernatural. This is America, after all. Now, Barris Karloff, the makeup that he wore when he was the monster Frankenstein illustrated that perfectly. The creature had a square box-shaped skull and a box-shaped hinge and very primitive lobotomy, very, very basic lobotomy. And uh, the basic cut used by the grave robbers when they stole cadavers. The monster's neck had these protruding things that were like electrical spark plugs. And people think they're bolts, but they're not. They were for energizing his nervous system and his brain and bringing him back to life. To give him, as I said earlier, Promethean fire. Lightning that was meant to animate him. This is why the Promethean fire thing is such a powerful allegory even today. And, you know, the awakening, people waking up and stuff like that. Now... It worked. It looked fantastic. It worked amazing, and Boris Karloff, you know, he established himself as a one of the supreme, you know, actors of the of Hollywood, and it left a very deep impression on people who saw it both in the cinema back then, and even people like me as kids watching on TV. The, but there was a still thing that it was based on logic. It was science. You, you know, Victor Frankenstein was a scientist, so this was put this was they were they took the european aesthetic of the golem right and they said well you know this won't fly to american audiences 
they want a scientific version of it. So they took out the, the you know, they, 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 there was a belief within the American Hollywood studios that they would not accept magic or ghost or supernatural agency unless there was an explanation that they belong somehow to the natural world and science could explain it. And this became, you know, all the Hollywood studios began to think like that. And it goes right onto the present. And that's why even today, if you go to make a Hollywood film, a Hollywood film, well, Hollywood doesn't have the power it does have now since the age of Netflix and the descendancy of like TV, you know, box sets. But up until very difficult to get money to finance a Hollywood ghost story because there was no rational scientific explanation to a ghost. Now, the early Frankenstein film was able to incorporate this because it was lacking in much of the supernatural. It was very heavily rooted in the concept of the mad scientist, the scientist that went mad. So there was a concept of sin and divinity and so on. Now, by the 1960s and the arrival of the Hammer film franchise, which began in the mid-1960s, and then in America you had Roger Corman doing phenomenal versions of, you know, Edgar Allan Poe stories, and they brought a new aesthetic to the horror movie, heavily involved in sadism. There was a strong, sadistic aspect to it. And this is probably because of Western English speaking's abandonment of more religious values. Now, the the main contribution to the original Frankenstein, the Boris Karloff one, it came to be associated with two Englishmen, the director James Whale, and Henry, sorry William Henry Pratt, who was the Boris Karloff, whose performances of the monster suggest the pathos of being the, who of not having to ask for life being brought back into the miscellaneous bits and pieces he was made from. So there was an element, another element, and the factor that makes the Frankenstein movie with Karloff workable is that the, the because of the English director and the English actor, they brought in this the Victorian stage gothic element. There was another film, a sequel called *The Bride*, *The Bride of Frankenstein*, which came out in 1935, which was also directed by James Whale. And this film combined a sense of sin with the new ingredient of sex, as it allowed Eliza Lancaster as the man-made bride. It, you know, there's that moment where she first sets eyes on her mate, who she's destined to be with, and registers utter revulsion. And they used that in films like TV shows like uh, Dark Shadows in the 1960s had that with the monster, the being, whatever it was. was. And Karloff, you know, becomes, he was a brilliant actor. In that film, he turns the monster into a Christ-like martyr figure. The film, you know, has evidence that of the performance of the rival monster maker that the Frankenstein theme was being very much dovetailed into the gothic Wuthering Heights kind of thing. The the unattainable love that you got in Victorian British romances like Wuthering Heights and the Bronte things. And I just want I just want to quote this. I have a copy here of a page from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and it, it, I just want to read it to you. It's very interesting. You know, this conveys the difficulty of putting this stuff onto cinema. It was already warm in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out, when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw a dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? Or how to delineate the wretch whom such infinite pains and care I had endeavoured to form? His limbs were in proportion, 
and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful, great God, his yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and the arteries beneath, his hair of luxurious black and flowing, his teeth of pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same colour as the dun wine sock, white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and his straight black lips. I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into its animated, inanimate body, and for this I had deprived myself of rest and health. I had desired it with the adieu that far exceeded moderation, but now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished, and a breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Now that was written by Mary Shelley nearly 200 years ago. And now you compare that to, that's, 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 that's transhumanism. And the kind of people who want transhumanism. Hackable humans, hackable animals. They don't know what it means to be human. And that's what Mary Shelley was putting across in Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus. That you can st stitch a, a person together from bits and pieces and put life into them. But you cannot do anything except put yourself in a position of damnation by accepting it. Because what you've created is truly a monster. Now that passage I read from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, have you ever seen that that sensation put across in any of the movies now you haven't really the nearest one to it would be the scene in The Bride of Frankenstein where she lays eyes upon Boris Karloff and screams and that was the nearest they got to it but still it just goes to show you how difficult it is to really make a good horror film now these this, this was a weird thing because what happened then was it took away the the the, the startling sense of danger and foreboding that became apparent to the viewer when the Bride of Frankenstein screams looking at Boris Karloff was too difficult for them to deal with and many for the studio heads as well because you were going into places no 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 that's European shit you know man we well, that's European shit we, you know I could just see the discussions in the in the in, in, in the in the Hollywood studios look you know, we, the Americans don't, are not like you Europeans. We, we can't have this situation where we, you know, we, we have people thinking deeply about things, you know. You know, they, we, we want to get them in, get their books, get them out. And know that there's, that if there's a danger, it's, it's science can explain it. Now, you Europeans coming in here with your goddamn magic and your goddamn folklore, you know, th th that, that, that shit may fly over there in the old country, but over here, this is America, and we're different. And that's not to disparage, you know, Americans, American audiences or anything, but there's a good point there. America was a new nation. It had been built on values that were seen as the antithesis to traditional European values. And that had to be reflected in every aspect of life. But we know that's not the case because the likes of H.P. Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe, <laughs> demonst you know, demonstrably, demonstrably showed that to be true. That there wasn't a deeper side to certain cultures within America. So then it just blended in the farce, you know. So we, then we got what we got was, you know, remember, I don't know if you've ever seen it, Abbott and, Abbott, Frankenstein meets Abbott and Costello just horrible you know and there was even a golem film called the golem and the dancing girl i've never seen it but i could only imagine but you know frankenstein for all it's you know you know that like old country shit it 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 made hollywood pay attention because it cost 750,000 to make and the studio was terrified it was going to bankrupt them. And within a year, it grossed something like $9 million. And by the, by today, that film has now brought in something like $20 million. So, you know, th the bottom line men in Hollywood were going to say, no, no, we, we're, we're on to, these guys are onto something, you know. So a phenomenal commercial hit. 
and it proved to Hollywood executives that Supernatural was commercially viable and then it opened the doors the floodgates opened we got the Jekyll and Hyde themes the devil in the flesh and it's often film story it's most it's very commonly filmed and it's all it's different allegories and different situational you know concepts it, it shows up over and over again and uh, there, there's a good reason for this that you know early cinema was a mobilizing force if films were able to denunciate from the local Christian pulpits they had to show a clear separation of good and evil you see the American sort of moral majority thing again and the Jekyll and Hyde team in all its you know forms but we all know that it from the, the classic John Barrymore film from 1920 it played the duelist kind of role you know the there was this the, the, inside the Robbie Lewis Stevenson story there's a strong sexual element a strong BDSM sadosexual element it, that book is quite intense when you read it now that's on that was on the, the school curriculum here in Ireland but there's a strong a strong and for years I mean for up and going back to the 60s and there was a strong sexual uh, element in that but it was, of course it wasn't in the the Hollywood thing because if you know the Bible Belt and all that stuff. And he played a Victorian gentleman who'd been misled by his cronies at a stag party in the visiting a brothel. Where his sexual instincts are awakened and he becomes the beast he'll hide. Now, the, his relationship with the prostitute was really not allowed in the, in the Hollywood version. And everything had to play on the good versus evil moral versus indecent thing Christian thing you know so it used what makes this you know it's still a good film and what it lacks in sort of grittiness regarding the, the relationship with prostitutes and brothels it it makes up for in things like sound effects so it includes you know you get heartbeats are very much used in it to create this the sense that the pulsating heart as the moment of r removal into another sign of like state of morality and the lurking sense of the primitive human the animal human and the enjoyment of the liberation of the, the sort of pagan inside Dr. Jekyll you know and you have these prayers for forgiveness in you know is is you know stands out it's like a landmark and spencer tracy did an incredible remake of, of in 1940 doing the same thing even though it played on the same morality uh, spencer tracy's performance is phenomenal and you know hyde is linked with natural elements and a huge part of this would be at the time in America would be the the abolition of liquor, you know, the the prohibition of liquor. That was a huge subconscious. So, like people, you know, where you say, again, I'm not saying Europeans are more sophisticated than Americans. I'm saying the different. So, say Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde to a Central European, it wouldn't be so much a. A, a, an, an allegory of the battle inside man between the ancient pagan forces this, the dark spiritual archetypes of the woods the wild man you know or in the wild woman the Wildendecken of the Germanic Teutonic tradition it, it, that's how Europeans would see it because of the long history and but in America at the time these films were made it was about prohibition and liquor and they're both equally valid because you know and you know there's no such thing as a bad archetype any archetype will do you've heard me say that all the time and it, it, this thing that you know the there's one scene in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde where he drinks the rain pouring rain and that looks like he's it's, it, that's like an allegory for liquor from a, from a bootlegger and in Karloff's portrayal of the monster in Frankenstein He's constantly bl he constantly blinks and finds it difficult to look at the first sunlight. Uh, the effect is malignant in the uh, in in one and benign in the other. In both are very strangely powerful. 
there's an element of some lost dimension in these films that harp on the horrors of the flesh more so than the horrors of the soul. So the prohibition and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the uh, man playing God in Frankenstein. Now that this is the whole fiend in the human form thing. And this is probably where you know where Hollywood excelled in bringing a new dimension to the gothic supernatural thriller. The odd dark house, you know, all the way from you know, like Bates Motel, the, even the Adams family house, you know, um, the the architectural embodiment of you know gothicism, tortured, disfigured, hideous form, a living embodiment of the same collective mythology. The brilliant Lon Chaney was an actor whom the myth became a way of life and an artistic and obsession. Lon Chaney's acting was almost like performance art you know it was almost when you when you watch Lon Chaney acting it's you you feel like you're more in a kind of a performance art space than a Hollywood movie and Chaney actually altered himself in all kinds of ways N not just by makeup by also twisting and distorting himself in a kind of a sadomasochistic performance and uh his version of Phantom of the Opera from 1925 and, and that is terrifying just based on how he looked he needed a vehicle which he could be physically repulsive so the story of this deformed creature of Paris whose face was unmasked as a living skull and inhibits the bells of the Paris Opera House and kidnap a singer for his you know his mate but is then taken out by you know the mob the human fiend demands what just to be loved in return as, and you know this is very similar to Victor Hugo's uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame it's just the, 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 the unlovable wanting to be loved and again that's a very deep gothic thing but the, the Americans saw that as like a love story a forbidden love where the, the Europeans would have seen it as you know like The Hunchback of Notre Dame uh, the Hunchback, which is placed by Charles Lawton in the Hollywood film, is not so much someone who wants unrequited love, uh, but it is Esmeralda's elevation to the top of the cathedral is seen almost like her own hero's journey uh, to make her a better person. You know, this is this is this is what we are. This is the kind of people we are when we watch a film. So, you know, what came from that, you know, then that leads us on inevitably to vampires. And the, the concept of romantic love as a mystical spell. And this becomes a motivating force in some... There's a fantastic film by Jean Cocteau called La Belle, La Petite. It came out in 1946, and that's a love affair between... It's, it's actually... And there's also he made Orphe in 1950, another one you have to see. And it's a love affair between life and death. In the most poetic we were, and also watch his, ver his version of Beauty and the Beast. A poetic reworking of the fiend in human form represented in philosophical fantasies by the haunting as the messenger of death. By the messenger of death. And in the Hollywood version of this theme, uh, gruesomeness wins out over poetry. In Lon Chaney's taste for the fiendish, deformed and mutilated was fully reciprocated by the director he often worked with, and Tom Brown. This guy was named Tom Browning, and Browning, who has made the third grade seminal f film in that supernatural f version, and that was Dracula in 1931 with Bela Lugosi. Now, Browning, when he made Dracula, there were distinctly a European vibe to that version, that version of the film. It was made in the same studio as Frankenstein using a lot of the same sets and uh, techni technical uh, resources. And, you know, based on the Bram Stoker novel. So you took Universal had German story editors and it was photographed by German cameramen, all from the UF, the studio, and then starring the great, you know, Hungarian Bela Lugosi. 
and just like Karloff identified himself forever with the supernatural role it was typecasting but a good typecasting the the magnificence of the 1931 version of Dracula with with Bela Lugosi it, it's the the conviction in which Lugosi simply utters those world those words I am Dracula so you know that it that that was a that was a threshold moment in cinema that was a that was a gate opening that was an incantation this is that's you know this is why the magical and the supernatural and the ritualistic can find so much commonality in supernatural and horror films when Lugosi goes I am Dracula that was the opening of a gate like the you know the invocation of the bornless one in Greek ancient Greek magic you know the the gate is opened and this the whole vampire theme probably owes its origins to the you know this primitive belief in the regeneration regenerative power of human flesh and viscera by the sacrificial blood who refreshes the tribe and that comes out in things like you know count you know countless bathroy and stuff like that now dracula the film established that the supernatural had a big time box office appeal provided it was sufficiently fleshy and bloody though the film had redeeming touches of you know gothic wit it was there you know the gothic wit of the whole thing and you know the tempting pinprick of blood on the guest's hands and uh, refuses other refreshment for refreshments murmuring i never drink wine people think that was gary Ullman that came up with that and it was bella lugosi and you know uh, no discredit to you know gary Ullman for it in francis ford coppola's fantastic version too now before very long the, the purity of the dracula team became corrupted i guess and supernatural films about vampires put on sadistic emphasis on bloodlust. You know, they get, a lot of them became very gory. And this, you know, the female, it was no, you know, obviously the female vampire chick was going to become a big deal to employ the lesbian stuff. But the lesbian stuff does have a long history. You know, the the vampire lovers, uh, you know, by Sheridan Lafanu, who was a Dublin Gothic writer, no relationship. And he, well, not that I know of, he's buried in Mount Jerome Cemetery in Dublin, which is like like something, a real life version of a Hammer movie set. to the cemetery. It's like it's on the Dublin Gothic Trail. If you're ever in Dublin and you want to see like a Gothic landscape, even to this day, the cemetery's still open, and the people greet you, and are young guys wearing top hats and tails, and they go, eh, "Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, madam." Uh, would you like to be take a would you like a tour of this of the crypts and this kind of thing you know uh, it's it's pretty cool actually and it's real it's not like it's not a tourist trap it's an actual mount jerome cemetery so it's just it's in harold's cross in dublin and if you're a dubliner and you've never been there shame on you but and it's full of lots of it fabulous uh uh freemasonic temples and this kind of thing so you know, you have to, to that Camilla and uh, the vampire lovers with a the lesbian theme. That did, that did exist in Gothic literature. So, but it was just that it was made more trashy in the in the movie versions. And um, there was a Danish director called Carl Dreyer, and he made a film of Sheridan Lafanu's Vampire, uh, the story at the same time that Hollywood was actually making Dracula with Bela Lugosi. And it was much more poetic and aesthetic work than the American film, but at the end of the day, it lacked the the charisma of Bela Lugosi, and also the yeah the 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 archetypal energy of Bela Lugosi's Dracula is crude, but it's still it's that's why it's so good. the The Danish version of the Irish novelist's Vamp- Vampire it was uh, it defined very precise one of atmospheric conditions for success in the supernatural you know he instructed his cameraman uh, to the effects he wanted in his biography he says imagine we are sitting in an ordinary room suddenly we're told that there is a corpse behind the door 
in an instant the door the room we are sitting in is completely altered everything in it has taken it to another level the light the atmosphere has changed though they are physically the same this is because we ourselves have changed and the objects are and the objects are what we conceive of them and that was the effect I want to get. This is what Troyer said. And if you watch the film, he did achieve it. You know, he used to he placed things like uh, wire gauze over a few, few feet in front of the camera, out of focus, to give this weird, strange, iridescent feel around objects and actors. And everything looks like it's done in twilight. You also, everyone's also seen, which is currently being remade by Roger Edgars, which I can't wait to see is Manu's 1922 Nostarathu, the German film. And that had like this deep focus photography for used for similar purpose and light and to create those kind of psychological, you know, discrepancies in the gap between what happens in normal daily life and the supernatural experience. And, you know, the old dark house theme where the architecture becomes an extension of the weird character's manifestation. He saw, you know, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, the whole town looks like that. Now, so, but in the sense of the, the haunted house, as we see in Bates Motel and lots of films, and even the, the Wergner's version of the Golem, he makes Prague look that way. They become, the, the architecture becomes supernatural, aesthetically charged backdrops. So there was, you know, there's loads of films like that. There was a film caught by Jack Clayton. If you haven't seen it, an English one called a ghost story called The Innocence, very disturbing film. And it's a journey down corridors by a tiptoeing cameraman with you know candles and wind stirring curtains, and then the suddenly banging shutter and the apprehensively stereotypical but quite powerful creaking floorboards. That that film, The Innocence, I I I can only watch that like every so often because it's. It's so it's such a disturbing film, and it plays on very disturbing themes of like, you know, children who are sexualized before they're adults and so on, and it shows that there is something demonic and evil about a child being sexualized at an early age. It's something dementedly creepy, and this in the age of drag queen story time, the innocence has come into its own, and. I love the, you know, we all love, me especially, the concept of the old dark house, the gothic mansion. And they fit well into, uh, you know, the the craft of filmmaking. Uh, because they're, there's a conventional style to them. And they are, they're, very, they're a stereotype that's easily achievable, but also easily, you know, economically created. And, you know... Hollywood films this is this is the biggest problem as a European myself that I have still to this day with Hollywood Hollywood films is the happy ending the hallmark ending so there was an awful film called The Arrival The Arrivals about these octopus like aliens that appeared on earth and it has this you know it's, it starts out very promising with a very disturbing looking spacecraft that you know full of non-Euclidean geometry as Lovecraft would say and it has these 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 kind of like encephalods who aliens who paint language alien language in it kind of squid ink and that's all great but the film ends up as the worst kind of horrible Hollywood pap you know that kind of thing and uh, where you compare that to a British film like Await further instructions. It wasn't a happy ending, and I'm that you know, quite a mass for kind of happy, sad, or an Irish film like a dark song. You know, yeah, okay, it ended in okay, but Jesus, what a price! Where American films, it's not like that. As a, ha- a lot of them still are, are burdened by the happy ending, and as a European, I find that very, very challenging at times. And that's what does that tell us about American culture versus European culture? Uh, like I guess time and experience, really. So, you know, with the Hollywood happy ending, film goers get their thrills. But are allowed to keep their self respect when they turn off the rational. And you know, even this crazy, you know, far fetched explanations explanations like James Whale in his nineteen thirty two film, The Old Dark House. 
they, you know, they, it's all gathers under one roof, a hideous collection of like various like misfit travellers, with Karloff as the horribly scarred and dumb butler. Uh, but there's there's nothing supernatural about the film. It's merely a grotesque parody of like oddness and unusualness. And as the 1930s wore on, the old house, dark house film became a battle with science, you know, rather than with the supernatural testifying and off and then later psychology with Hitchcock and so on uh, testifying you know really to the exhaustion that they had run out of the original classic stories of the supernatural as you know western society you know it's growing unease over science science's contribution to the insecurity of the period such as the atomic bomb and things like that that's when the the sort of like the red scare science fiction films all took off you know, so like you had the Black Cat, nineteen thirty four, and the title, which recalls, you know, it's a Poe story, but the plot shows how the scientist has invaded the realm of the supernatural, and it's set in an ultramodern castle in Transylvania. It was host Boris Karloff is not a vampire, but a scientist who has built his home on the site of a wartime massacre, that which caused that which was caused by his own treachery. And then you got, from that later on, the archetype of the demonic child, the devil child, and or the child who enters into the supernatural world and is res, res, restored or resaved or returned back to innocence. You see that in the, in the Exorcist in the 70s and at the end of the 70s, Poltergeist, a movie that has aged very, very badly, I must say. And... A lot of this this thing, it comes from an English type thing, you know. You know, this story of like almost English in, in you know eccentricities brought into Hollywood films, like The Uninvited, which was direct, directed by a Lewis Allen, and is set in a haunted, a haunted house in Cornwall where the brilliant Ray Milan. And Root Hussey feel, hear, and finally see a ghostly pre presence. And this this is the site of an ectoplasmic apparition. And it's the film, it's actually the, the, the low point of the film. Uh, the, you know, it, the suggestion, especially by Ray Milan's acting, is far better than the actual manifestation of the monster or the, the entity. And that's, that's, that, that, that there is the, the key to a successful supernatural horror or cosmic science fiction film is the suggestion rather than the actual manifestation and you know in the 1960s you had the innocence did that a lot and then you had the turn of the screw which the governess and two haunted children uh the same kind of thing that came back that was in the 60s and then the other film that came out the others with nicole kidman that was outstanding and it played on the kind of thing of the child in the other world and the child being rescued somehow and the other world either being the supernatural world of ghosts or being possessed or in the world of the demon that if the innocence of childhood can be attacked by the supernatural then nothing is sacrosanct you know that kind of a thing and the ultimate example of that from the 60s from that classic 60s period is Roman Polanski's Roman Rosemary's Baby which came out in 68 the whole thing of a newlywed wife living in luxury in a New York apartment gives birth to the devil's child and Polanski's ability to take the supernatural you know at this sort of like angle rather than directly is what makes the power of you don't see the baby right? you talk to so many people and they say but at the end of the film, she looks in and sees the baby is hairy and Huxley the devil. The baby doesn't appear at all in the film. It's merely suggestive. But that's how good... Of, you know, Polanski is a horrible human being, but he can make a bloody good film. And th that he could actually create such a vibe in Rosemary's Baby that people who saw it believe that they actually saw this devil baby in the crib, in the cot... Well, that was never shown. That was a false memory. That's 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 good filmmaking. 
And of course, then it's a weird thing that his own wife, Sharon Tate, the following year, was, you know, when nine months pregnant, uh, is murdered. Uh, he kind of created a devil baby of his own. And if you read Tom Tom O'Neill's Chaos, yeah, it really does come across that way. So yeah, I mean, you know, Rosemary's baby was so successful merely because of suggestion, and the, the way it looked, you know, you know, the, the 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 lighting effects and so on. And then, when after World War Two, and you have the concept of the the atomic bomb. And the horrors of the Holocaust, and the horrors of the pogrom, the horrors of the pogroms, and the horror of the what was done it was going on in Russia, and the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and in the nineteen fifties, you have horror films that appeared, and they become mutated into the science fiction thing, the nuclear age zombie, and the first real links between horror. On the cinema now, uh, between um, the supernatural, the supernatural magical experience, and uh, the the humanity destroyed by science, I, you know, I spoke with twenty eight days later it comes apparent then, and you know, even things like elements of the Nagasaki bombing, the Hiroshima bombing, uh, the man, the U, the U.S. space travel thing. And by the time 1953 went in, you had the British excelled at this. The British excelled, you know, at cosmic horror. But in the cinema, you know, things like The War of the Worlds in 1953, things from another world took the form of, in, you know, weaponized intelligence that could be halted in its destructive tracks only by explicable mag magic. Therefore, the germ theory. The thing is another one. It features an extra, the original thing from 51. It features an extraterrestrial monster that drank the blood of earthlings like a vampire, but it needed constant replenishment to survive. This was redone again by John Carpenter with Russell, with, with uh, Kurt Russell, in the 1980 version or 81 version, where, uh, or, or 82 whenever the film came out uh, played very heavily on the themes of the AIDS thing at the time although when that film was made the AIDS thing wasn't a big deal and that film was so well made that like in a few when people saw it a few years later in the 83, 84 they were thinking oh it's kind of an allegory about AIDS which it was but nowadays it's an allegory about what's hidden in the Antarctic and that's when you get a really good horror film when it takes on a new cultural resonance with the passage of time and you know there were other films from that period the 50s again I'm talking about they were based on the idea of a, an expeditionary f force of supernatural beings landing on the earth to form a you know an infection a coven among people uh, Don Seigel's Invasion of Body Snatchers which came out in the mid 50s we all remember that and that was remade into an even better version with Donald Sutherland in the 70s and the extra extraterrestrial protection of their magic spells of earlier times, the demonic possession of human beings, the monsters in such films, while being post-atomic metaphors for the evil that scientific man has unleashed upon the world and upon himself, in a similar vein to Frankenstein's man-made monster, it echoes the sin of the creator. So... When we develop technology, the Martians heard our signals. You know, the SETI program, you know, the whole thing of what are we doing sending messages into space when it could bring something here? And you know something, folks, it probably did within in 2020. Uh, or tw late 2019. Now, it's interesting that these films, for all their, you know, their, at the time, the modernity, they had a similar kind of, like, letdown in that, there's no Boris Karloff or Lu, Lu, Bela Lugosi or Christopher Lee to act as almost like a magi to incarnate uh, the the force, the evil force. And you know the the it's it's not what the the, the monster looks like in prosthetics. This is what 
modern CGI film making misses. It's not the modern aesthetic or the look of things. It's the sensation. And like, what was, what was, Boris Karloff, a guy in a with a square shaped mask with two bolts in his head, could be, should be absurd, isn't. What's it's it's got power. It's got charismatic charge. Bela Lugosi, a Hungarian fella in a cape. Same thing. Christopher Lee playing Dracula. You don't need all the special effects in the world to make it happen. It's the mere suggestion. That's one of the reasons the remake of The Thing by John Carpenter works is because it's really Kurt Russell's charisma that carries that film. No, it's in Carpenter's sense, that's not the degrade the film, but it's the extra charge. And then, you know, the demonic possession thing, the course, The Village of the Damned. Again, John Wyndham, The Midwich Cuckoos was the novel that was based on. And uh, The Village Where the Women Bear Children with Strange Powers. It, that's directly, that's that was, well, I wouldn't say Wyndham was, you know, plagiarizing or copying it. But it comes from a very ancient, you know, the Jewish tradition of the, the, the Dibok, or the unclean spirit of the Hebrew tradition. And that inspired, you know, the a lot of, you know, the Golem films from the, like, the 1910s and stuff, the 19, well, the 1913-ish. And uh, you have the Christian invocation of witchcraft, The Unearthly Stranger, made by John Christian in 1963, where the tears of the otherworldly visitant have corrosive streaks on her cheeks in keeping with the belief that damned spirits may never show the human weakness of repentance. And then you have the, the, the Kabbalistic emphasis in a lot of American culture and stories like that, Waiting for the End. Uh, the, Leslie A. Fielder wrote a book about this, of essays, on the, the, the Kabbalistic um, influence on, on American films. And he wrote, The long dominance of the Western and detective story is challenged by the largely Jewish product of science fiction, the basic myth of science fiction reflects the outlook, the social consciousness, the utopian concern of the modern secular Jew. And Fiedler's argument was that if one considers films like Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, that's very much a Kabbalistic work. And we, we know that is, you know, that this is why all these dumb truthers think it's like whistleblowing about the moon landings, because they, they don't have spirits. They don't have, like these truths don't have souls. They don't have them. They 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 can't, they don't have the depth of personality to see anything above you know you know oh the moon landing never happened why space may be the final frontier but it's made in the Hollywood basement oh uh, that's your argument then that they don't have a deeper aesthetic to reach into these things at all that's that's a classic example Kubrick's two thousand and one is absolutely a cabalistic uh, epic and. You know, it's it, that that that's there to be seen for all. It's nothing to do with like blowing, and all these dipshits saying it's all about like you know blowing at the to the point where it becomes absurd, where people claim that the the, the hotel room and the the shining is proof is is another whistle blowing thing. Let me tell you something about Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick's films are so archetypally alchemical, mystically. And cabalistically deep, that we will forever be finding new meanings in them. Particularly films like Two Thousand and One and The Shining, not so much Eyes Wide Shut, but specifically those two films. They carry with, them, and even Barry Lyndon to an extent, but specifically The Shining. And that's why I believe Stephen King was very unhappy about The Shining is because the, the Kubrick's version of it took a good story and took it to a place that Stephen King couldn't. And Kubrick being a brilliant filmmaker, it, both when he was making 2001 A Space Odyssey with Arthur C. Clarke, the book and the film were being created at the same time. And they were bouncing the, the bits and pieces off one another. Both very astute, well-educated men with a strong Fortean education. And 
I see Ivory Beshebet Singer's work all over 2001 and The Shining. And you could see, you know, years ago I wrote an essay for a Discordia magazine where I compared, it was a newsletter back in the old days. Remember when you went to Kinko's and you made like little newsletters? Where I compared Jack Torrance's, Jack Torrance's, you know, issues with living in the hotel in isolation in Colorado as an allegory for an Eastern European Jew suddenly arriving in Brooklyn. You know, in a completely different world. And, you know, that's a lot of Ivis Shevitz Singer's work is like that. And I think The Shining has that element to it. And, you know, the... the 2001 A Space Odyssey if you if you look at that and, and you watch it in tandem here's an exercise for you guys right here's a extra, extra curriculum schoolwork for the tribe right I want you to watch 2001 A Space Odyssey right and watch it until the part where they encounter the obelisk on the moon then switch it off and then watch Kenneth Anger's Lucifer Rising. And when Lucifer Rising ends, then continue watching the rest of 2001 A Space Odyssey. And you know what? You'll thank me for it. And you'll understand why I consider the cinematic genre of horror, cosmic horror, and I'll just call it Kabbalistic science fiction. So personally powerful to me in my life, both as a spiritual, a psychic, and an artistic and creative development. There's the surface, you know, like you could say something like when uh, you see 2001, it's just like the Kabbalistic tree of life, you know. If you... I don't think any of us will ever get the key there. There's been a lot of stories in the news lately about people setting themselves on fire. It's been going on a while, actually. It started when when Trump was elected. Some soy uh, set himself on fire outside Trump's hotel, screaming, "Not my president!" Uh, and during his, while he was president, some guy walked onto the White House lawn and set himself on fire, and. Then you had the guy in America who set himself on fire for Palestine. And then you had, last week, someone, a guy who was in a, a, a kind of sad story. Well, they're all sad stories, I guess. But a guy last week who I was reading a Substack blog was obviously in a state of complete mania. He was a throofer who, it just he, it just ran away with him, man. It just, he just blew his mind. And he, one of these people who woke up much too quickly... And he taught by setting fire to himself near where Trump was. He would bring attention to corruption in the world or something like that. It's kind of a sad thing because he started out by apologizing to the emergency services people and uh, the public who witnessed it, you know, before he gave his manifesto, which was really quite uh, quite all over the place. It was a classic throuter who... This has all the stuff in his head, but doesn't have the archetypal grounding to formulate it into something useful. It just turns to mania. And so it got me thinking about, well, it got, we've been talking about just a few of us online, about the, 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 the sacrifice to fire. You know, the whole idea of fire gods, fire elementals, fire demons. And so I thought, you know, in light of this human tragedy... We could have a discussion about the the spiritual history of fire. Now, when I always think of fire, I always think of the the Indian fire god Agni, and Agni was reincarnated from the fingers of holy maidens who twirled the fire drill. So it's almost like um, the Murdras bringing Agni into manifestation, and Agni is where the root word of ignition comes from. Now, but there's a long and a enormous canon of folklore and mythology and magical literature relating to 
to fire as an elemental spiritual force. And in Finland, they believed that fire to be the child of the sun in Finnish folklore. And it was descended from the heavens where it was rocked in a, a cradle of yellow copper. In a lot of Indo-European folklore, the agency of fire was commonly a bird, you know, the phoenix and so on, that kind of thing. Also, some people have stolen the flame, were supposed to have concealed it originally inside a forest and even a single tree. So no doubt because fire was first produced by ignition by the ignition of two sticks rubbed together it's not just a case of two sticks rubbed together you have to build like a hole in the stick and then i use a bow to turn it and create friction but ultimately because fire was initially started by our, our you know paleolithic ancestors by using wood wood as a, and kindling so fire became connected with the concept of a tree and in the celtic and germanic pantheons the mistletoe which grows on the oak it is a lot of stuff comes from Fraser's the golden bough became it the protective charm against lightning while the acorn carried in a pocket gave security to the traveler so the, this is why the oak is so sacred to germanic and celtic cultures now the it, we all know that the priest the, the the priest class of the celtic people the druids are associated with the oak tree in fact Drua is the Irish for oak and the county Derry in Ireland is literally means the land of oaks. And they were also within the Celtic pantheon, the masters of fire. Uh, lesser mortals who acquired the supposedly miraculous art of igniting fire, who were considered in consequence to be inspired by the gods. So the flame of the gods. This thing is a long, deep history. Now, people who created pottery and smithies who created metal or did worked in metallurgy this was as a consequence of firing the pots or stoking uh, the flame and these craftsmen were felt were considered not only just you know workers in metallurgy and ceramics but they were also having the the power of controlling fire now that's very interesting in light and recent events because these people who set themselves on fire, the fire was the the the, the self the self immolation was due to not being in control of their minds, of their feelings, of their their psychology. So the fire was almost not only just a sacrificial thing, but also a correctional thing, where we look they look in the past we would look upon the smithy, the the farrier, the iron worker, and the ceramic, the potter, as masters of the fire because they were in control. They knew about the correct temperatures to melt metals, to create, to, to, you know, to make smelting, and the right heat to fire clay at so the pots would solidify rather than break. So they were the masters of the fire. And smiths in particular were known as the masters and, the, uh, and the, almost like the alchemical experts of fire and iron. And they were, it was assumed a form of magic because they had power over the elements. And this would also include, believe it or not, healing the sick. So if you were an, a smithy or a, a potter, you were considered having the power also to heal the sick. And that's probably where the concept of the, you know, the, uh, the the herbs and stuff being ground down in a clay pot to adhere to you know create healing, because the the ceramic pot was f created by someone who had the f the power over fire, a godlike a human with a godlike ability, the mort mortar and pestle kind of thing. The and they this considered um, this was considered very upsetting to the the early Christians that you had all these people who still venerated the smithy and venerated the potter and there's loads of like it's particularly in nordic you know literature the you know like the, the forging of of you know molnir thor's hammer by the two dwarf brothers the the christians were very upset by this and uh, there are even hymns within christianity warning to guard oneself against the spells of women smiths and druids in a number of medieval legends, the smiths were regarded as agents of the devil. They turned it right around the Christians. 
And we all know about Vulcan, the Roman fire god, it was became the patron of workers in metal. So they he was kind of turned into a kind of a saint. Now alchemists held that metals were actually living things, elements, the actual entities. And they were also, along with the smithies and the potters, the masters of the fire. Now their philosophy involved the doctrine that all physical substances consistent, uh, consisted of a combination of the body and the spirit, which being submitted to fire, left the residue and the ash representing the body and the smoke of the soul. And they believed that the spark of the divine life descended from the heavens to be embodied in all matter. This suggests the old myth of the original fire having been stolen from the gods, which we know from Prometheus. And, and, and it's, not, it's common in, in a lot of, uh, not just only in the European folklore. Now, the salamanders were, were, were like a lizard were considered, with, you know, to live with, 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 with the ability to be burned. They were immune to fire. So where animals were connected to it and so on you know the dragon the phoenix the salamander and an extension you know a, 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 an extension of this was happened uh, in within a european western magical practice was the public demonstration of a man's mastery over the fire element so wizards in their ceremonies walked over burning coals which is common everywhere or even swallowed fire or handled red hot iron ingots without apparent injury so the holy men of Fiji, taken outside the European pantheon, they had the power to walk uninjured over red-hot stones at the annual at an annual fest, festival of the Feast of Fire. In an insert, had been an known certain instance have been known to walk a distance of over forty feet of burning flame. Now another aspect of the magician was the ability to quench the fire by magic. Now, Odin, within the Nord Nordic myths, he also was a wizard. So he was a god and a wizard. And he's described in the Elder Eddas as the master of the mysterious art of fire. It descended during the course of ages to the magical priesthoods and later still to Christian priests and saints who were said to be immune from being killed or injured by fire. Now, most famous being St. Catherine the, of the Catherine Wheel of Siena, who fell into a blazing hearth and emerged unscorched. So there's lots of complicated and very interesting fire rites that have survived from pagan times into modern times and are still retained in what they call indigenous communities and, you know, areas where people will be looked down on them like, you know, well, pagans, hillbillies. And it's believed by certain individuals that a forest blaze might be quenched by a ceremonial dance performed around a man-made fire accompanied by the singing of a rain charm. This would be as a means of halting a, of halting a heavy rain shower by sympathetic m magic. And the Australian Aborigines pour, will pour water into the fire as a symbolic quenching in the hope of sympathetically magically creating a downpour. You get this in Hinduism as well. Now, magical fire precautions is an interesting one as well. And that was practiced in Europe and particularly in Germany and also among German emigrants in the United States. The, it was an effective form of fire insurance was considered to be a text worn as an amulet upon the body and which the following is an example. It was written down like it would be in German, of course. Like unto the cup and wine and the holy supper of our dear Lord, gave unto us, gave unto us, his dear disciples, on Monday, Thursday, may the Lord Jesus grant me in daytime and at night that no dog may bite me, no firearm may hurt me, no weapon, no steel, no iron can cut me, no fiends and no witchcraft, and no enchantment hurt me, and no fire will ever burn me. That one probably came from a sort of an, an amulet invoking, well not invoking, but petitioning Odin. Now you have the will of the wisp. This is the old legend that declared that the spirit of fire, after descending from a remote part of heaven, made its home among men. And you get that in a lot of folk beliefs, particularly in Britain, the flame which flickers over the marshy places and sometimes believed to be luring travelers to their doom and to the bog. 
and that was thought to be of supernatural origin, the will of the wisp of the jack-o'-lantern. The mysterious flame called Sel Elmo's fire, which sometimes cling to the masts of old ships at sea, has an ominous significance as described in the lines of this poem. Last night I saw St. Elmo's stars with their glittering lanterns at, all at play on the tops of the mast and the tips of the spars and I knew we should have fell weather that day. And there's a fantastic scene in the Gregory Peck movie version of Moby Dick where he captures St. Elmo's fire. It's fantastic. Now, the human soul is generally have been taught to be conceived or an, an aspect of fire, taken shape as a luminous ball or a flickering flame. Uh, reminisce, you know, reminiscent of a fire drake or a guardian dragon of hidden treasures. In these tales in which the souls of the old sea kings glowed as flame among the tumuli or buried mounds where they lay buried with their hordes. And we saw that with like, you know, Smog and Tolkien's work. And balls of fire observed dancing at night on the shores were regarded by seafaring folk as souls of drowned sailors eternally seeking rest. Often the soul would be manifest as a blushing light moving from the chamber of death. Now that's an interesting one how we don't we don't consider the UFO UAP phenomenon with the concept of fire. Even though they're glowing balls of light seen at night or even in day. But we don't actually consider them to be of fire. Of part of the the Agni tradition. So, you know, even in the past, there was a special act of deference to the one who was newly dead. All the household fires would be extinguished to relieve the soul from the obligation of paying homage to the heart, which was the altar of the fire god in Ireland, St. Bridget. The, the, it was, it would, in Ireland, it wouldn't be the fire god, it would have been St. Bridget. In, it would be Vulcan in the Roman, in Roman, Roman Romanish paganism. And the family ancestor, and that's also where the ancestral worship takes place. That's a big thing in Scandinavia, the co and also in in like northern England and places like that. The concept that a soul left the body in the form of flame, inspired an old custom often employed to discover the missing body of a drowned person. They would light a candle, and it was inserted in a crust of bread, and then floated upon the water, the and in the part of the water, the lake, whatever, where it stopped being where the corpse is supposed to be and in this ritual the flame was set to symbolize the soul and the bread the body and there are huge you know concepts right surrounding fire in all the world's folk legends there's uh, cities castles thrones and even human beings and tree is entirely composed of living flame and that made its way into, like, you know, the human torch within the Marvel pantheon, the Fantastic Four. And animals and dragons breeding fire persistently haunt the imagination of our ancient European ancestors, and not so ancient European ancestors. And as I mentioned, the salamander, which is a, you know, was seen as a mythical lizard like monster. I know it's a real animal, but like it had a mythical quality. Could even live within fire without injury to itself, while salamander's feathers was the name given by the pagan people to asbestos. And that may, it makes you want, if they were called the, because they knew they would find the asbestos rock and they, the fibers pulled from it, they knew it was impervious to flame. So they called it the salamander's wings or the salamander's feathers or the salamander's uh, crown. And it makes you wonder why they have this war on, on asbestos, doesn't it? Like asbestos, people don't know this, but I mean, starting in the 1960s, there was a huge, a huge war against asbestos, and it was seen as causing cancer. Now, it, what, how the cancer would happen would be they were cutting the asbestos, and with saws and stuff and so on, and the fibers would get in the microscopic form and were said to cause cancer. But in its natural state, like. If you live in a house that has an asbestos roof, you're not going to get cancer. It's one of these sheeple, normy NPC terrors. But it's interesting that asbestos was seen as a sacred, magical substance by our ancestors. And they, 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 they went against it. 
and the the phoenix which is really an although it's made its way into the european pantheon is really an arabic legend and it has the continuous notion of fire law and uh, although the elemental may die it is immediately reborn it's the phoenix which after a period of years ignited its own nest and burned itself to ashes emerging from the flames pulled safely with a new new life that's directly out of semitic paganism and then there's the concept of the trial by fire like the young maidens who have to pass between raging fires as tests of chastity that's a that's a common one in folklore and this was reflected in trials or ordeals of fire which the accused person submitted himself or herself to the judgment of god seeking to vindicate his innocence by walking barefoot over red hot coals or by carrying a red hot iron in his hand and these crazy theological christian disputes took place where at times submitted to somewhat like you know these real arbitrary form of judgment by fire and it was not you know it was like and crazy for you know different elements of christian theology to be cast into the flame and which one emerged was the authentic version so they would literally be taking christian texts is my one right is your one right well let's throw them in the fire and the one that isn't born is the one protect the real one because god didn't burn it so and that's 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 christians doing magic this is christianity for you here's christians doing magic by but also for forbidding it at the same time and what's interesting about fire is that it's universally not just in the in the europe european concept but seen as a means to dispel evil and evil spirits and you know because you think about it the ancient ancestors the fire would have dispelled you know wild animals wolves and stuff like that you know you wave a few wave a burning stick at them at night they'll run away the south american indians would carry flaming torches when they went into the amazon jungle uh, so the illumination they provided to terrify any spirits lurking there and this is a uh, this is seen in european christian uh, theology as well there's a thing in bulgaria called the feast of saint demetrius where lighted candles are placed in the stables to protect the animals from attacks of demons and also there's a purification element of fire and that's well known and there's actually there's an old saying that went i have myself passed through the fire the implication is that one is refined by hardship as gold is refined by fire so that's the thing, chemical thing again and this is the you know this is the whole concept of the ritual and burning of witches came from that then the heretical burning at the stake and the same this was this was not just punishment you have to remember that these these crazy christians were not just punishing were not merely punishing uh, heretics and witches by fire they were seen as purifying them you know purifying them oh so when the the witches the the devil story of ladron when the bishop was born uh wild birds were seen flying uh, sparrows or songbirds were seen flying around his his ashes and they said well that was a soul being released now and going to heaven this is how they justified burning people alive uh, they would believe that they were releasing the soul from the devil and allowing that person to go to heaven and um uh, so the stake was uh, was was a it was a spiritual purification thing and witches it was taught they would possess tainted blood that could only be purged by flame and it was the same reason that the heretic was born alive and his ashes broadcast or thrown into a stream remember in the film the thing where the blood ran away from the the, the hot wire where do you think that archetype came from the kurt russell movie the john carpenter film the identical concept is is, is in beliefs and to do with the afterlife as well in purgatory souls are purged of sin and said to be in the domain of fires both spiritual and physical hell is for the damned and uh, with its invisible flames well you know this is the later christian theo- you know there was an 18th century theology there was a, a a priest called father gilbert bauer and his uh his descriptions of hell are hilarious 
I found this quote that he said, You know what happens when meat is salted? The salt enters every nerve and every bone. In the same way, hellish fire will enter into the innermost marrow and be distributed throughout the entrails. I mean, this, this is this beautiful religion of Christianity, you know. And the, the supervision of hell lay in the hands of a class of beings who in earlier cultures and mythologies we used to be, what, fire, fire elementals. Uh, but they were now degraded to unclean spirits, cast down to the eternal furnace, and then they became torturers of the damned. So, you know, you see how they, the, the Christians took, they inverted everything. You know, it's like, it really was the Great Reset part one these were ancient spiritual traditions that had been born out of the human beings first ability to create fire and the magic magical and mystical rituals going along with that and then christians turn that around and say oh it's all about the devil it's all about damned you know saint catherine on the on the catherine wheel she survived because she was saintly and the wheel represents the burning the 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 hell of the, the pagans on earth imitating the devils on earth and uh, you know so there was a within the actual magical slash practical tool for fire making was a wooden bowl and in that was a hole that was drilled and then a piece of wood a spark was produced to then ignite a wisp of straw or a piece of dried lichen or something uh, a piece of fluff or sometimes bird feathers and it's, it's been suggested that the impact upon social life created by this invention must have been equal to the invention of the steam engine or the the microchip or the broadcast radio TV signal in that the the the, the difference it made to life here you didn't have fire then you automatically had fire and just turned this ability to create fire into a godly pursuit now think about that too like what I spoke early on the show about v v Voyager Voyager in the Star Trek film that's now to me is starting to see the same way that this thing has it's out in space it's gone forever the revealer of planets it has died and been resurrected and these in these this this is chaos paganism that I've been sort of promoting for a few years now. You know that you know on the altar on the altar of everything and nothing, and this the creation of fire, the primitive type of fire making, even back then, was the the custom of need fire, used among other other implements to wheel when turned over oak spindles to ignite a straw or hay. So this is the transference of fire to fire from one burning thing to another, like a fire machine or a fire dispenser. Need fire, which was lit at times of distress, particularly when the cattle were afflicted by a plague or some kind of rot to their feet. And this was kindled afresh and was never taken from an existent fire. Among the, among the Slavic people, they used to call it the living fire. And invariably this brings us to what well bonfires you know the bonfire festival and there are reports of christians about these fire festivals which are now considered to be bogus and also by imper imperialist forces from either greece or rome venturing into celtic or teutonic lands and talking about mass sacrifices by fire. And these are now, un like the wicker man, these are now unally, ver universally considered to be propaganda. There's no, there's no proof of these massive burning wicker men. It was probably propaganda created in order to dehumanize Celtic and Slav, well, they wouldn't Slavic wouldn't exist then, but Celtic and Germanic people at those times. And... So, you know, the whole thing of the wicker man, it wasn't true. It didn't happen. And uh, there would have been ritual burnings of people, of course. The Christians do that. What do you think the burning of, uh, you know, heretics is? That's a ritual. That's a magical ritual. So the Christians sit there and they talk about, oh, they used to, they used to burn people alive in a wicker man. And then you say to the Christian, uh, excuse me, heretics, witches, 
Jews, Catholics, Muslims, Huguenots, and they'd go, "Oh, it's a different thing." No, it's not. It's the same thing. You know, it's the same thing. They just don't. They just don't want to believe that they're uh, they're not they're not the the ultimate in piety, and uh, and and and, it's, uh, and that's on an industrial level compared to a pagan might burn you know a person once a year for a harvest festival in ancient times how many were born during the the witches and the persecution of witches and the sectarian wars following the reformation and so that the the, the bale fire the bale fire now we're coming up to beltana we're coming up to beltana and um uh, that valpurgis night into may day and i'm going to try and get a I'm not going to linger too much on this because I want to do a Valpurgis night Beltana uh, special for Vaughan. So just, you know, quickly, you know, the story there. The the animals run through the passage in order for purification. And I'll talk more about that in the in the Valpurgis May Day thing. Uh, but um, then you had, like, the, the sympathetic magic of the declining sun where flowers were lit to celebrate various points of the year, spring, summer, midsummer, the beginning of winter and midwinter and it's even been said that the festival of Guy Fawkes which is basically based on an anti-Catholic thing a ceremony replaced one of these ancient fire ceremonies and they just took it and replaced it with that uh, St. John's Fire St. John's Eve which is celebrated uniquely in this part of Ireland and not much and parts of Scotland and Denmark it happens in the summer and that was a pagan festival as well that they just renamed St. John's Eve. And when I first moved here, I was amazed that they had a, their bonfire night in summer and not sound like on the east coast of Ireland. It was a different culture. The east coast of Ireland would be more Germanic. The the west coast of Ireland would be more Celtic, more Gaelic. So, so you know, of course, the early church hated all the stuff. You know, it's like that joke on Black Adder. You know, being cold is God's way of telling you to burn more Catholics. And the fire was used in Christianity to ex the expulsion of evil in the form of witchcraft. And so since sorcerers were said to be terrified of fire, which they weren't really, they were just going to be, they were, you'd be afraid of fire if you're going to burn you alive. And in the old Scandinavian custom, it was also to hurl a burning coal after a departing troll or a witch to neutralize the spells and a relic of the old May Day festival Beltana is still celebrated in Peebles in Scotland and in the and in the early 1920s the con this custom was instituted in Cornwall of lighting a chain of bonfires on St John's Eve 23rd of June so you see the distinction there is that the the sound the the, the heritage is more germanic so yeah, east coast of Ireland, greater Anglo-Saxon, European Celtic tradition. West coast of Ireland, Cornwall, Scotland, St. John's Eve, the 23rd. More of a Celtic, that Iberian, Gaelic kind of thing. And on St. John's Eve in Cornwall, a sickle was cast into the flames, followed by the chant, in one bunch together bound, bonfires, blossoms here are found, both good and ill, thousandfold let good seeds spring, while ill weeds fast weathering, this fire shall kill. And even there was even more recent innovations has been the reintroduction of fire leaping ceremonies. This has been since the sixties we've had the growth the restore the restoration of pagans, where which are seen a mo they're really modern versions of witchcraft and you know Gerald Gardner repopularized this stuff on the Isle of Man where they're carried out in secluded places on the old Celtic or Germanic feast days the Isle of Man being unique that the northern half of the island is Viking the southern half is, is Irish you know culturally and uh, these were done in strict privacy but occasionally in front of the television cameras because good old Gardner he knew exactly how to get publicity because he wanted it for a very specific reason and you've heard me talk about that reason why many times so ancient fire magic has really persisted in a number of uh, in you know the hearts the heart uh, venerations the heart fire 
you know and one it's one of the theories uh, that the, the term heathen comes from people of the heart fire and it's, but it's, that's been that's been disputed but I'm sticking with the one that heathen is people of the heart fire and of course that's all disappearing because we now have central heathen and so on well I still have a heart fire but many people believe that a poker placed in an upright position against the fire bars will form the shape of a cross helps the fire to burn while others consider that the rays of the sun are permitted to shine upon the hard fire the fire will go out so that this is a kind of a transference thing the fire of the sun is greater than the fire of the hard fire yeah, that's kind of to remind you that even though it's your home you're still subject to the to, to the, the greater gods Lulon Fada in the Celtic pantheon and sometimes the future is red in the ashes in the same way tea leaves are used to read the future and in Yorkshire where there's a very strong well there was I don't know how about it now but in rural Yorkshire in England there were very strong fire traditions including witch posts on either side of the fire that had sigils that would stop prevent demons from coming down the entry or witches they would say coming down the chimney which was seen the unguarded entry point to the house you've heard me read talk and write about that many times but on the eve of St Mark in the 24th of April in Yorkshire the the custom was practiced to determine, to determine who in the family were destined to die next in line which is pretty weird isn't it and um, fire is seen as the seed of all existing things to which they must return again and again and it's been looked upon that generations of pyromaniacs the alarming idea that if human humanity could only be consumed entirely entire then it must as a matter of course arise from the flames renowned renewed and purified this doctrine became popular in 17th century england one of the most notorious symbols of the revolutionary school was solomon eccles he was this fanatical prophet of doom who walked through the streets of london in the nude bearing a cauldron of burning brimstone upon his head and <laughs> a flaming a flaming torch is the symbol of freedom in the New York Statue of Liberty, which we know is Lucifer now. And the same significance underlies the actions of young men in the East and the West who in recent times set themselves alight and commit suicide as living torches. Now, you see, this is brings isn't it amazing how it all comes full circle? It brings us back to their political or religious faith that they set themselves on fire, that they sacrifice themselves into the flame. And it is a long, you know, I'll give it, you know, it's very interesting how fire is used in protest that way. You know, apart from these poor bastards setting themselves on fire, thinking it's going to make political changes. There's, the, uh, uh, that arson is something. There, there's an, uh, I'm working on the sort of the gestation of a new book about, you know, ontology and when I was growing up in Ireland arson was a big Christmas thing and I'm serious now where I grew up in Ballymun there back in the 70s there was a tremendous period of boredom everything was closed between when I was a kid back then the shops would close on half day on Christmas Eve and wouldn't open till the day after New Year's Eve. So you had over a week, New Year's Day, so you had over a week of nothing to do. You had your Christmas thing, and then you had this bizarre area in between the two dates where there was nothing to do. And I always associate that as ar with arson. Now, I never did it because, um, but I, I, I well, I went, I seen it, well, I didn't, didn't see it done, but I, I went to burning it was invariably the fire the fire in in tough areas around Dublin the fire brigades would be at their most busiest between the Saint C the day after St Stephen's Day and New Year's Eve and pe that would be when the scout hall would go up in flames that would be when the community center would go up in flames now where I lived in Ballymun there was loads of factories along Santry Avenue that had closed down when the Arab oil embargo had struck in 1973 or whenever it was, 73 or 74. So I was a little kid 
9, 10, 11 after that happened. And I remember these dozens and dozens of huge factories. One of them was the Brother factory that made electronics. Now they make Brother saw machines, but they also made things like pocket calculators and stuff that were a big deal, but that had closed. A lot of them had closed. And I can remember you were guaranteed a certainty that you would hear the old sound, the old ding, 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 the old fire brigade and bells, and they'd be out in those factories putting out fires. And now looking back on it, I see that those kids, it was a form of protest against Christianity, I think. Uh, because they they were this this the Christianity that had locked down the country had made you know between between New Christmas Eve and the day after New Year's Day and the boredom it created and the bad weather you know the bad weather was always a big deal about that you know rain and cold and kids with nothing to do and nowhere to go and. Uh, so I can remember the, I can remember the, I can remember the extreme boredom of those weeks my friends and I kids hanging out but the older kids who would have been 14 15 16 they they would burn down a factory or a, a community center or something like that and and I, I, I and you would always remember that the the, the ar- arson attacks pyromania was a huge thing in those neighborhoods those tough neighborhoods and looking at it now it was a revolt against a Christian lockdown because the Christians had locked us down during this period. There was nothing, you know, and the adults didn't really, you know, here's your toys on Christmas Day and then they kind of ignore the kids. And they'd be all looking forward to New Year's Eve so they could get shit-faced again. And But the kids were bored off their their, their, their asses. And, and I, it's almost like now I look at those arsons as as a revolt against the Christian lockdown. I do see it. Then it wasn't boredom, it was like a statement that, and it was probably like a wicker man of kind, of, 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 a, of a sort, you know, in terms of like, you know, the ancient pagan soul in these kids would be like, well, f- the hell with this. I'm gonna burn something just to piss the Christians off. Although they wouldn't have consciously thought that way, but it's, it's almost like on the archetypal antar- 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 level they would. And, I can remember I can remember that so clearly there was, there was the Christmas tradition of arson attacks. Yeah, that was like that was a that was a big Christmas tradition where I lived growing up arson. And who would have thought that all these years later it would be seen as a spiritual thing in terms of the impulse behind it. The the mystery of life eternally unfolding well I hope you had a good you enjoyed this VON and got a lot out of it and I'm hopefully we'll be back for a Valpurgis Beltana VON in a few days probably what's well, the 27th of day so I'm going to try and work get that one out and uh, until then look after yourselves and feck them if they can't take a joke